evening. Uh, thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, I'd like to start um, just by uh, making a reference to the um, German gun that is pointed at me right now. <laughs> <It's> a, <laughs> there's a little bit of pressure from that. So, uh, but before we get started, um, I wanted to just show you the uh, one minute trailer for the book that'll just give you a little bit of a sense of the story and if you're not familiar with it. And you'll also see Harold Hayes, who is the one survivor of the 30 Americans who's still with us today. He's 91 and he lives in Medford, Oregon. Oh, I just advance it. Okay. Do I have to point it at them? <laughs> Momentarily. <laughs> oh, in 1943, I was a 21-year-old medic serving in the Mediterranean. On a bright sunny day in November, the C-53 I was traveling in with 12 other medics and 13 nurses encountered a violent storm. Pilot flew across the field one time. Next pass, they started shooting at us. We were forced to crash land in Nazi-occupied Albania. We were trapped there for months. not to talk to anybody about where we had been, anyone who helped us, and how we escaped. Okay. Um, well, I wanted to start just by thanking the National World War II Museum for hosting me tonight. I'd also like to thank the nurses who came tonight and all the veterans as well. It's an honor to be speaking here. It's a place that has taught and inspired so many after, about the courage, honor, and sacrifices of the greatest generation. I'll begin by setting the stage for how the 30 Americans arrived in Albania, which is just across the Adriatic from Italy and north of Greece. I'll then discuss the secret rescue, read a small section from the book, share some photos, and then I can answer any questions that you might have. In early November 1943, 13 flight nurses and 13 flight medics boarded a C-53 transport plane with a four-man flight crew. The nurses and medics were traveling from their headquarters on the island of Sicily, north to Bari, Italy, where they were scheduled to pick up wounded and ill patients from near the front lines and transport them to more fully equipped hospitals around the Mediterranean. Bad weather had plagued the area for the past three days and patients were piling up. Though the weather was sunny and clear when the plane took off that November morning, the aircraft soon encountered a violent storm that pushed it off course. The flight crew managed to avoid the dangerous water spouts that formed around them, and they were disoriented by the weather, had lost communication with the station at Bari, their destination, and their instrument panel was malfunctioning. After several hours in the air and not realizing they'd crossed the Adriatic, they decided their best chance of survival was to land the plane. They saw an airfield with German planes that looked like they'd had been abandoned as so many had been during the war. But when they attempted to land, the plane suddenly came to life and the Americans found themselves under fire. The pilots quickly ascended the aircraft only to find themselves in the path of German fighter planes. The routine two-hour flight had turned into a five-hour journey and the pilots were now dodging enemy planes without any weapons to defend themselves. They ducked in and out of clouds in an attempt to evade the fighter planes and eventually found a small patch of land near a lake and nestled between rugged mountains where they could land. As the plane careened along the ground still saturated with water, the landing gear slowly sank in the mud until it was completely submerged, bringing the plane to a violent stop. The force embedded the plane's nose in the marshy land and the fuselage hovered upright for a few seconds before falling to the ground in a belly flop. The crew chief who'd been in the back of the plane and wasn't buckled in as the other passengers were was severely injured in the crash. The passengers tried to get their bearings and eventually exited the plane to find they were surrounded by rugged terrain. 
Within minutes, a group of rough-looking armed men dressed in homemade uniforms came out of the woods and surrounded them. This began the Americans' month-long journey in which they faced a barrage of life-threatening incidents, had very little food for weeks on end, and were forced to hide at night with villagers who risked their lives to help them. During one German attack, which occurred within a week of their crash landing, three of the nurses were separated from the others. Not knowing if the three women were alive or dead, the rest of the party had no choice but to continue through wandering through rugged terrain, tired, hungry, and ill, looking desperately for a way to escape. For weeks, they were led through one village after another by Albanian partisans, who were members of a resistance group who found them food and shelter. At times, the Americans weren't sure they could trust the partisans, who seemed to be using them as propaganda for their cause, rather than helping them escape. Meanwhile, the Army Air Forces scrambled to find out what had happened to the missing plane and its passengers. The Army Air Forces sent out search planes throughout the Mediterranean, but there were no signs of them anywhere. The stranded Americans quickly learned that Albania was a small country, about the size of Maryland, which had changed very little over the last several hundred years. German troops had occupied Albania after Italy surrendered to the Allies in September 1943, just two months before, and thousands of abandoned Italian troops, many of whom would not survive the coming winter, still wandered the countryside. The Americans also learned that the tensions between two Albanian resistance groups, the partisans who had first helped them when they crash landed, and the Bali Kamtar, or BK, had erupted into a civil war and was as much of a threat to them as the German presence. After 22 days, the American men and women finally located a British officer who escorted them to his mission's camp. Though the Americans didn't know it, the men at the camp worked for the Clandestine Special Operations Executive, or SOE, Churchill's secret army. The British who greeted the exhausted Americans, weary from three weeks of walking, soon contacted SOE headquarters in Cairo, who then relayed the information to American officials, as well as to the Office of Strategic Services, the nation's first intelligence agency and the precursor to the CIA. Now that the party, they were aware that the party was safe and in the British care, OSS quickly devised a plan which involved sending in an officer to help get them out. That man would be 24-year-old OSS officer Lloyd Smith. Smith had been stationed in Egypt for almost a year and been promoted to captain when he was recruited by OSS in Cairo in early September 1943. An OSS recruiter promised Smith the excitement he craved, particularly because his brother Clayton was headed overseas to serve as a pilot on a B-26 bomber. Smith later wrote, quote, unless I did something more exciting than ordnance, I would have trouble living with him when we got back home after the war. Soon after Smith arrived at OSS headquarters in Bari, Italy, his commanding officer said, we have a priority job. How would you like to volunteer to go to Albania? Though Smith knew little of the train or the language, he agreed to locate the stranded Americans and bring them to the coast for a sea evacuation with just a three-hour briefing under his belt. Smith received his orders on November 30th, and by the evening of December 2nd, he had already made two attempts to cross the Adriatic by boat from Brindisi, another port city southeast of Bari, Italy. When his second attempt had been canceled that day because of the discovery of German mines in Brindisi's port, he decided to go back to the OSS office in Bari to wait until the area was cleared. He had just arrived when the Germans unleashed a massive air attack on the harbor, just three blocks away, that would later be known as the Second Pearl Harbor. Smith was fortunate not to be hurt. At least 1,000 people, including civilians, were killed, countless people were injured, and 17 Allied ships were destroyed. On Smith's final attempt to reach the coast of Albania, he took a boat under the cover of darkness and wearing the uniform of a captain in the AAF to help support his cover story as a downed pilot if the Germans captured him. The treatment of a prisoner of war was far better than that of a spy, particularly with Hitler's commando order of October 18, 1942 in place. The order demanded that all Allied men caught behind enemy lines be killed immediately, a policy that violated international law. Around 11 that evening, the captain was able to safely anchor a half mile off the Albanian coast, and the crew rowed Smith and the supplies to the narrow shore. 
With the black shadows of mountains looming over him, Smith hiked some 800 feet up a switchback trail to reach Seaview, the series of caves looking, overlooking the Adriatic that allowed OSS and SOE to deliver and evacuate personnel, bring weapons and supplies into the country, and pass on intelligence material. After five days of waiting in the lice-infested caves for information about the location of the American party to come over the wireless, Smith decided to see what he could discover on his own. With a 45 caliber handgun, a compass, maps, and a shepherd to guide him, Smith set out on his mission. While Smith searched for the Americans, the British, in coordination with OSS, assigned two men to escort the Americans to the coast for a sea evacuation. After days camped at SOE's mission headquarters, the party left in the hands of Lieutenant Gavin Duffy and Sergeant Herbert Bell. Duffy, whose dark hair, slight build, and Clark Gable mustache gave him a distinguished appearance and made him look far older than his 24 years, led the group along with Sergeant Herbert Bell, a quiet, baby-faced young man with blonde hair from North London who acted as the wireless operator. It was December 7th, the second anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. They spent days walking for, with little food, and the Americans were more exhausted and ill than they had ever been. On Monday, December 20th, the Americans' 43rd day in Albania, they learned that they would have to start backtracking because of nearby fighting between the Germans and the partisans. It was too much for some, including the American pilot, who asked Bell, the British wireless operator, to send a message on his behalf asking for an air evacuation. Cairo received the message and forwarded it to the Army Air Forces. The Americans camped out for several days in the same mountain villages hoping for an air rescue. And with that, I will read a, the prologue, which takes place the morning of the attempted air evacuation. On a chilly, overcast December day in 1943, Gavin Gary Duffy, a tough, no-nonsense 24-year-old special operations lieutenant working for Britain, peered through his binoculars from the cover of an Albanian hillside and watched in frustration as waves of German troops and tanks moved through the steep and winding roads of a town on the valley's other side. The town was perched high above an abandoned airfield where American rescue planes were scheduled to land that morning in a risky and dramatic mission to evacuate a group of stranded American men and women. The party had been lost for 52 days and was barely surviving the treacherous winter landscape while evading capture by the Nazis. As Duffy continued to watch the activity across the valley, three German trucks and one armored car drove from the town and parked near the main road that ran in front of the airfield. Now he was certain it was too risky for the rescue planes. With no way for him to communicate directly with the pilots, Duffy's plan had been to signal that it was safe to land by laying out yellow-orange parachute panels from a supply drop to make a large X on the field. Now that the Germans had moved in, there was nothing he could do but wait while the other, with the others and watch. His party of exhausted, ill men and women, riddled with lice and worn out from weeks of traversing Albania's rugged terrain while eluding the enemy, stood near Duffy and his wireless operator as cold wind cut through their filthy, tattered uniforms and blasted their malnourished bodies. They were now so weak from hunger, sickness, and despair that the several miles they had walked from their village hideouts in the rugged mountains that morning to meet the plains had turned into a slow and grueling journey. Some of the men who had volunteered to help Duffy give the prearranged signal to the plains nervously fingered their pieces of parachute. The others continued a silent vigil. Then at half past noon, the sudden roar of multiple planes filled the air. Seconds later, three Lockheed P-38 Lightning fighters, nicknamed Forktail Devils by the German Luftwaffe, flew so low over the airfield that the weary group huddled on the hill could see the pilots' faces. A Vickers Wellington, one of Britain's most famous and durable bombers, its machine guns poised for action, suddenly appeared as well. It buzzed down the airfield, ready to provide cover for two C-47s that followed behind. Not only were the Americans coming to the rescue, so were the British. More twin-engine P-38s came in threes until 21 planes filled the gray sky. The men and women stood transfixed by the huge display of air power. It was the most glorious sight they had ever seen. 
None of them had expected so many planes, certainly not Duffy. They were amazed at the effort being made to save them, but they were even more affected by the stark reality that they couldn't signal the planes to land. With each passing second, their hopes of rescue were further shattered, and they were overcome with feelings that had become inescapable, frustration, loneliness, and heartache. It would be many more days and many more obstacles overcome before the OSS and SOE had completed their mission and rescued 27 of the 30 Americans. OSS officer Lloyd Smith eventually located the party being led by SOE officer Duffy <clears throat> after Smith had searched for a month and faced his own life-threatening hardships. During an all-night march, Smith asked the group to vote on whether they would stop and rest, adding a day to their journey or keep going. The vote was unanimous. The American women and men would do whatever it took to escape. By the time they reached the coast, the party of 27 had walked more than 600 miles. Weeks later, Lloyd Smith returned to Albania to rescue the three nurses who'd been trapped after the German attack. For his heroic efforts, Lloyd Smith was first nominated for a Distinguished Service Medal, but was then awarded the Higher Distinguished Service Cross. His citation reads, for extraordinary heroism in connection with military operations against an armed enemy during the period December 7, 1943 to March 21, 1944. Captain Smith's resolute conduct in the face of great peril throughout an extended period and the successful accomplishment of an extremely hazardous and difficult mission exemplif exemplified the finest traditions of the armed forces in the United States. SOE officer Duffy was awarded the Military Cross in recognition of exemplary gallantry for his work. Of his journey with the Americans, he wrote, for the party in general, they behaved spl splendidly, especially the nurses whose courage and faith were a tonic to the people escorting them on what might have been a quite a disastrous journey. High tribute should be paid to Captain Smith, who did magnificent work in the latter part of the journey. Tribute should also be paid to the people of the villages through which we passed, most of whom were extremely hospitable, even when a reprisal by the Germans would be the price to be paid. The bravery and courage of these men and all those involved in the rescue was extraordinary and is what inspired me to research and write the story over the past two years. And with that, I wanted to share some of the photographs that I found during the course of my research if this works this time. Okay. Uh, medical Air Evacuation Transport Squadron was an innovative new medical military program with the Army Air Forces that transported the wounded and sick from hospitals near the front lines. It was started in 1942, and during the war, it transported more than one million wounded troops with only 46 dying in flight. In 1945, General of the Army Dwight Eisenhower deemed air evacuation as important as other World War II medical innovations, including penicillin and sulfa drugs. This is a photograph of the 807th. It was made up of 90 personnel, including 25 nurses and 25 medics. Uh, they came from across the country and had all received special training at Bowman Field in Louisville, Kentucky. Of course, some of the medics had volunteered for service while others had been drafted, but all the nurses were volunteers. It's interesting that some of the nurses had actually been stewardesses before the war. In the 1930s, lots of airlines uh, required the stewardesses to be nurses because they felt like it um, comforted the, the nervous passengers. Air it, flying at the time was still very new, and in fact, FDR was the first president to fly on official business for the country. This is a photograph of Harold Hayes um, when he was little over, he was about 24 in the one picture. Um, when the Albanian adventure happened, he was 21. And this is a recent picture of him. Um, I spent quite a few weeks with him at his home in Oregon, um, interviewing him and asking him 10 million questions. And what's so interesting about Harold is that he's 91 years old, but he emails more frequently than I do, I think. And uh, 
He also loves to scan pictures. I mean, he is just, he is what we should all aspire to be, embrace technology. <laughs> um, but he, he truly was a key for me writing this story. Uh, there were two books that were written, uh, two small memoirs. One was written by one of the nurses in the 90s, and another was written right after the event happened, but it was unpublished, and his uh, son found it years later and um, self-published it in 2010. But it didn't provide any of the context of the story, how the nurses um, got involved. And, and when I first came across the story, that, that was one of the things that intrigued me so much. What were these 13 women doing? Um, how did they get to Albania? They weren't supposed to be in combat. And, uh, and that was one of several angles to the story that intrigued me. But Harold was very critical. He has a memory that, I mean, he could tell you what he ate for lunch on Tuesday of, you know, in, in August of 1985. It's, it's extraordinary. Okay. Uh, this is a photograph of, of me with Harold. He was showing me the route that they took, and a lot of the villages uh, we, I was able to put together through the archival research I did with the SOE reports, with the OSS reports, uh, Harold's memories as well as um, the nurse's memoir, that, re that really helped. But I think of all the dozens of villages, there were only three that we were not sure of, um, of the names of those. And, and these villages could have been, you know, one house. Sometimes they were. Okay. Um, on board the plane were 13 medics, of course, including Harold Hayes, and then uh, t 13 nurses. Um, I should have said in the previous slide, one of the medics, um, there were 13 of them, but one of the medics was with the 802nd and not the 807th. He happened to be hitching a ride that morning to pick up his paycheck and, uh, you know, got quite a surprise. To be part of the MAETS, or Medical Air Eva Evacuation Transport Squadron, the nurses had to be between 21 and 36 years old, weigh between 105 and 135 pounds, and stand between 62 and 72 inches tall. And the nurses, the nurses involved in the Albanian experience ranged in age from 20 to, 23 to 32, while the ages of the medics ranged from 19 to 36 years old. Uh, here we have the flight crew. Um, left to right is the co-pilot, the pilot, the radio operator, and the crew chief. And of course, I mentioned previously that the crew chief was the one who was seriously injured in the crash landing. Uh, he was the only one unbuckled, and, and he was in the back holding on to the fuselage and uh, fell forward and uh, hit one of the nurses in the face, gave her a, a black eye and loosened some teeth. But um, he did some significant damage to his knee, and they had to um, carry him on a stretcher um, for, for part of the journey, and then he rode on a mule for most of the, the rest of the journey. And until the day he died, he did walk with a limp. The pilot, I thought this was interesting, that he was only 22, uh, but he was the senior officer on board the plane. He had just been promoted, I believe, the month before. Uh, this is um, some examples of the rugged terrain in Albania that the Americans faced. Uh, the Germans stuck to the roads, so the uh, partisans kept the Americans traveling mostly through the mountains where the villages were. So it did provide some safety, but there were plenty of German patrols that they easily could have run into. Uh, this is the town of Barat in Albania. It was the site of the attack um, that the Americans faced on their fifth day in Albania and led to the separation of the three nurses. Um, they were all scattered in individual homes because people didn't want too much pressure on any individual family. They all had very little food. So uh, they were all housed in, across the, the town. And when the Germans came in, the three nurses that were separated from the others, their family told them to hide in the basement. Um, and, and at that point, they got cut off from the rest. But when the others fled, they were fleeing for their lives. There were um, planes strafing the roadway that they were on, and they were diving into ditches to uh, save themselves. 
This is a photograph of Kostaj Stefa and his wife. If you can believe it, his wife is 101 years old, lives in, Alba in uh, Italy, and I sent her a copy of the book and it arrived on her 101st birthday. So they, the family was delighted. But um, unfortunately, Kostaj was one of the partisans who led the Americans um, throughout Albania for multiple weeks. And he, while there were times when the Americans were very sus suspicious of his actions, he was definitely a hero. He was leading them from village to village, keeping them out of the Germans' hands and finding food and shelter for them. Um, unfortunately, when he separated from the Americans, the rival group did find him and tortured him for several days. And then when communism took over in Albania after the war and in 1948, he was executed for his work with the Allies during the war. This is a photograph of the telegram that was sent to Harold Hayes' family alerting, him, alerting them that he was missing. Can you guys read that? His, uh, his brother was um, 16 years old at the time and had just gotten his driver's license and uh, had never actually been in a car by himself when the family got the telephone call that uh, they had a telegram waiting for them at the train station. And the parents were so distraught that they sent the son without thinking about it. It was the first time he had ever driven by himself and he brought back the telegram to the parents. This is a photograph of Duffy, the British SOE officer, who is being um, thanked for his work by two of the nurses. Uh, I loved this picture. Um, he, uh, he was instrumental in their rescue. And um, unfortunately for the Americans who did um, get together twice in the 1980s for reunions, um, they had heard inaccurately that Duffy had died, so they were not looking for him. Um, but it was not until 1990 that he actually passed away. This is Officer Lloyd Smith, the American who was 24 years old at the time. I met his son recently at the OSS Society event, and he looks exactly like his father. I knew who he was immediately. Um, but Lloyd Smith stayed very close to the nurses and medics in the years after this event, and uh, one of the medics was able to be at his uh, funeral as well 60 years later. We're missing a map. Well, I will just reiterate that uh, the Americans. I'm sorry. Oh. See, I need Harold here to help me. <laughs> uh, let's see. There it is. Yep. Um, and then the map. There you go. So you can see where they crashed uh, was very north of, <laughs> and very, um, very far from, uh, their route was very circuitous, as you can tell. They went through dozens of villages. I actually, for the map in the book, just plotted out any village that they spent at least one night in, um, just to keep it a little simpler. But um, as you can see, the, the Americans were being taken toward the border. Um, and they were actually, their plan, they felt like their best chance of escaping was to go towards the coast where they would find, hopefully find a boat and somehow get back to Italy, which was, um, you know, even though it was, the, the atmosphere of Albania was unlike anything they had seen and, and several of them wrote that it was like going back in time several hundred years. Um, Italy was only a hundred miles away across the Adriatic. And so the reason we ended up calling the book The Secret Rescue was that the Americans, of course, were sworn to secrecy when they uh, were finally rescued. Um, they were uh, told not to, to tell anyone for fear of hurting anyone's chances for future downed airmen who, who might find themselves in harm's way. Um, and then when communism fell in Albania after the war, 
the Americans felt very strongly that they didn't want to endanger any of the people who had sacrificed so much and helped and risked so much for them. Um, so they continued to keep this a secret, only discussing it among themselves at these two reunions in the 80s and their families. And with that, um, I just wanted to say what an honor it has been to share this, this story with, uh, with you this evening. And I would be happy to take any questions that anyone may have. Yes? He's going to get a mic, too. To, if, sorry. So the question was, where were they heading first? Yes. They were, their headquarters were in Catania, Sicily, and they were trying just to go two hours north to Bari, Italy. The fighting, um, the front lines was only about the 70 miles from Bari, so they were getting in as close as they possibly could to the front lines. The sick and wounded had received some initial treatment, and then the MAETS medics and nurses were flying them to more fully equipped hospitals around the Mediterranean. Um, they got completely disoriented, and instead of you know, going a little ways north, they found themselves crossing the Adriatic um, and landing in Albania. Did, did all of the uh, uh, American uh, nurses and, and uh, medics survive, including the three that were separated? Well, my publisher would say you'll have to read the book to find the, out the answer. <laughs> but it is called The Secret Rescue. It, it is a miracle. They all do make it back, but it does require two separate rescue missions. Yeah, what I was wondering about is why did they head to Yugoslavia, Greece, instead of heading for the coast right away? You know, they really, they knew nothing about Albania at the time, and uh, they were just making their best guess. And one of the partisans, um, fortunately for them, some of the partisan men, young men, had been taught at a, uh, the Albanian vocational school is what they called it. It was um, the Red Cross uh, taught them English. And so when they landed, one Albanian in the group actually spoke some English. And he is the one who I think recommended that they try to get to Vlora, um, which is shown on there, it's above sea view, um, to get a boat. So that was the best advice that they had at the time. Could you give us a little more background on what prompted you to write the book, what you discovered and, and precipitated your following sure. up and writing? Um, well, I found a, um, a newspaper article written in the 40s that um, talked about this story, and I had never heard, heard of it. And then the fact that there were 13 nurses, it was such a large group, you know, how do you manage hiding 30 people? Um, there were so many small elements to the story that it intrigued me, but of course, there are many stories that you can't write a full book about, and I needed to find out if I had enough primary information out there. Um, so I found the two memoirs, which was very helpful, but there were lots of blanks, and they disagreed with one another a bit at times. So I, I started tracking down family members, and that's when I learned that Harold Hayes was still alive. And, and he, for me, was the, the final decision that this, I could pull this off as a book um, because there was someone that I could ask the questions that I wanted, you know, a million questions, and he was always so patient about it. But uh, without that, I, I, you know, it would have been much more difficult to tell the little personal stories, um, you know, and, and just wondering what they were facing at, at what point, what were they thinking. Uh, Harold is a very unemotional person, but the thing that he always gets emotional about when he talks about is the idea that his family did not know where he was. Um, that was the thing that really got to him because the Army had no idea that they were in Albania. You know, they were looking around the Mediterranean searching for them. But um, so that was a concern for all of them. But I think that it was the idea of all their parents getting these telegrams saying that, you know, their son or daughter were missing and, uh, you know, and not being able to tell them that they were, in fact, okay. Um, but the thing that I think I gained the most from, from working on this book is meeting the tons, you know, of the group of 30 people, the families are large out there, and particularly with the Internet these days, you can find anybody. 
Um, but we were able to, I was able to track down almost everyone's families, including several of the Albanians um, that were part of the story. And that just added such a new element to me, uh, for me, to the story. And um, of course, I also went to Albania to retrace some of, of the journey in, in, of the group. And that was also very helpful to just kind of you know, see what it was really like in these villages. They haven't changed that much. The capital of Albania is very modern feeling. and, and um, it feels a lot like Italy, but when you go just a half hour or an hour outside to the villages, it's, it feels like it could be, you know, the 1900s. Um, so uh, I learned a tremendous amount through the whole process. Um, we know about post-traumatic stress disorder now. How did your, um, how did these people do in their lives after their return to the United States? Did they function as nurses? Did they stay in the service? Were they tr so traumatized by this that, and not being able to verbalize about it to anyone? You know, it's, it's interesting. I really wanted to know a lot of those details, and I was able to find out some. I mean, there were definitely different reactions. Um, Harold, for instance, uh, really never talked about this. His two adult children, um, you know, had not learned much about the story at all until I started interviewing him. Um, he would only talk about it with his wife, but he would always say, I, was, I wasn't scared, I wasn't scared. And then one morning we were having breakfast at his retirement home, and suddenly Betty, his wife, says that she remembers they got married right after Harold got back. They ma met and married very quickly. And she says, don't you remember all those nights you woke up screaming and you had these dreams that you were you know, running from something? And, and he's like, oh, yeah, I, I guess that's true. Um, but I know one of them, they all continued in the service. The, they all went uh, to the States. One nurse ended up serving in France later, but they mostly were in the States. What was kind of sad is that they all thought when they left, when the larger group gets back and they're quarantined at a hospital in, in Italy for several days as the military figures out what they want them, what they want to reveal to the public and, and what they want to do with them. They all thought they would eventually be taken back to Bowman Field where they had their training and they would all be reunited. But only a few were sent there. So it was actually um, 50 years later before a lot of them saw each other again. Um, some, you know, there were friendships made between some of the medics and some of the nurses. And, um, but what was interesting too about this is that of course the nurses were all second lieutenants and the medics were all enlisted men. So they all had done their training. They were all part of the 807th, but they had done their training separately. So the morning of their fateful flight, they were virtually strangers. And uh, they had never flown with this flight crew before who had actually never flown together either. Um, so uh, the, the, you know, the, I think a lot of the protocol slowly slipped away as the weeks passed. But, um, but at the beginning, they were virtual strangers. Um, but of course, an experience like this bonds you, and, um, and that's when the reunions later on were helpful. I have three questions. One is, how long did it take you to write the book from the beginning to publish? Number two, how many miles did you travel? And lastly, when were they allowed to publicize all of this? I mean, it's a secret, and how long did it stay a real secret? I know I'm going to forget your questions. <laughs> I will start with um, the process. It, um, I think I, it, it was about a year and a half from start to finish, but it was a very quick process. Um, Little Brown rushed it through. My publisher rushed it through. So, uh, so it was a, an eventful year. Um, and normally, I think you have like eight weeks to edit, and I had one week to edit, um, to, to make the edits that they suggested. Um, but your second question was how far I traveled. Uh, we certainly did not go 600 miles. Um, <laughs> but uh, we tried to, we went to the crash site. Um, we went to the, fail, the town where they stayed for 10 days waiting for the air evacuation that failed. And some of the highlights for me of those, those being in those villages, um, there were others we went to, but being in those villages, there were a couple times we met three men uh, who were just boys at the time and that remembered the nurses. Um, the one man in the village where the failed air evacuation happened kept talking about the pretty nurses. That's what he remembered as being a young boy. Um, and then, of course, I gave him my card, and his grandson, who's 16, has been emailing me uh, with lots of questions, and he wants to write a book. So it is a very small world these days. Um, 
And your third question was? When were the veterans allowed to speak oh. about this story? Well, they all, um, they were, what happened was right after the event, they were all told, you know, you, they had to sign multiple documents saying they weren't going to tell anything. And then what happened, interestingly enough, was the British officer uh, went to the press. And I don't, I was not able to find why he did that, whether the British wanted that to happen, whether he did this on his own. But he went to the press and told um, some of the details of the story. And um, Hal Boyle, one of the American correspondents, um, wrote the story based on, on that interview. But the American military held it for a few weeks. Um, but that kind of let. Um, the Americans off the hook to talking about it at all, but what they couldn't talk about is um, any of the people, any of the specific places they had been. So they were interviewed by newspapers when they got back. Um, Harold felt like he was a celebrity at the time. He was given um, extra gas coupons and lots of things by his from his hometown. Um, but uh, yeah, so I hope that answers your question. Oh. Here you go. Please. Most World War II stories are about men. Any consideration of making this into a movie? I hope so. <laughs> um, I think it would be, you know, a, a great movie. Um, you know, we're certainly hoping that happens, but there are no definite plans at this point. Did the German fighters score any hits on their plane when they were? There was um, a hole in the tail. Um, there could have been more um, damage, but that was the one that piece of information that I could verify from numerous sources. Um, when they landed, of course, they were so disoriented from the crash. It was raining, and then this armed group of men uh, come out of the woods, so they didn't spend a ton of time at that moment looking at it. They did come back the following day because they decided that they needed to burn the plane. Um, that was the proper thing to do, they decided. And I was able to, for, for my research, I went through the National Archives in, in Washington, D.C., but also the British Archives and the German Archives. I don't speak German. I had someone do it for me. But we were able to find that the German soldiers did, in fact, come across the plane. And they were only able to get out a damaged radio um, because the Americans had burned it. And there was some inter, uh, IFF um, technology on the plane that they destroyed as well before they left. It was top secret um, information about identifying planes as friend or foe. How much did the Germans know about this group? Did they know, they knew they were there because they saw the plane, but did they know what the makeup of the group was? That's debatable. Um, and I was really hoping that I could find this long trail of paperwork in the German archives, and there would be one, you know, for the movie, there would be one guy going after them. Um, but uh, it's not, we're not sure. They heard a variety of rumors when they were traveling. Um, that there was a Gestapo agent who was in one of the towns um, who had called in people to, to get them out um, or to, to um, arrest them. Um, they were hearing all sorts of things. I mean, one of the funny things is that the way people communicated in Albania at the time, because this was a land with no electricity, um, most homes had no running water, they did what they called the mountain telegraph. And so you would stand on one mountain and yell important news. Um, <laughs> If the, someone else on another mountain heard and thought it was important, they would yell it as well. So there are several times during the course of their journey that they keep hearing it, and they're asking Kostas, Stefa, and the other partisans, what are they saying? And they get very excited because he says, they're saying there's an American invasion. Um, and they're thrilled at this news until they realize they are the American invasion force. <laughs> so, um, And I think that's the last question. Thank you very much, Kate. Thank you.